How's it going, my Crusader kings and queens? This is Dr. Hefe, and Paradox has just released patch 1.2.0 for Crusader Kings 3. So I thought I'd go through the patch notes and make a little TLDR for y'all. Now I'll put a link to the Paradox website where you can read the full patch notes in detail if you'd like. And I've highlighted the changes that I thought are important, but let me know in the comments if you think I've missed anything. So, starting off, there's this section called Free Features. I don't know how these three things got added into there and why certain things were kept out. But the main thing is the Ruler Designer, and I'm not going to go into that in this video because I think that's a huge change that requires its own video. However, there's also a character kill list in the character window, which is, you know, somewhat useful if you want to look back and see who you've murdered, who you've executed. A fun little flavor addition. Adding the functionality to attach your armies to another allied army located in the same province in order to follow the other army, that's a pretty big change. Should help out with the microing if you just want to follow a large army. Maybe you're in a great holy war. That's where I see this really coming into use. In your normal wars, you're pretty unlikely to have an ally that you're going to want to follow. In fact, you're usually going to want to be setting the pace for your conquests and your attacking of other armies and hoping that the AI follows you. But this should take out some of the micro. This is a feature in EU4 as well as Imperator Rome, so it's definitely nice that it's finally been added into Crusader Kings 3. Okay, added a new game rule that controls the AI willingness to do matrilineal marriages. This is huge. Would have been a great feature in my mother of us all achievement run this should the default setting should make it more likely that your close family engages in matrilineal marriages you can set it to always uh, but that may make it more difficult for you to set up beneficial mat well not matrilineal patrilineal marriages with other female rulers but it will definitely make it way less likely that lands will pass out of your dynastic hands. So if you give it to daughters or granddaughters that they won't just go and get a regular marriage and all of a sudden some kingdom in your empire that was part of your dynasty is now being ruled by some other dynasty, which can be frustrating. Constructing a brand new temple now gives your faith some fervor. I originally selected this as high impact, but when I looked at the game, this only gives you plus one fervor. However, it is nice that there are more ways to increase your fervor. That's one of the things in the game that is really lacking that you have very little control over is how much fervor your faith has. In fact, you're more likely to get a lot of negative events from sinful bishops that have a huge hit to your fervor than positive events that increase your fervor. So I'm glad that they're adding more ways to increase your faith's fervor. Founding Holy Orders now increases the fervor. Uh, great Holy Wars decrease fervor by less. And in fact, invalidated Great Holy Wars now reduce fervor by much less. So cooldown between Great Holy Wars has been increased up to 30 years. So that means that, you know, these great holy wars won't be draining your fervor more often. And minimum fervor has been reduced to 65 so that the cooldown, you know, it helps balance this cooldown. Should be interesting to see. Successful holy wars now affect fervor significantly less. So this is really good. It seems to have reduced it by, I believe minor holy wars used to reduce it by 2. Duchy holy wars by... Uh, three or four. Anyway, it's less. This is also useful because usually your vassals will be declaring holy wars, which reduces your fervor, which then, you know, makes it longer to convert lands and also you have more heresy outbreaks. Another nice thing, unsuccessful holy wars no longer reduce the attacking faith's fervor. That is great because the number of times I see my vassals do holy wars and fail is too high. It's too damn high. And finally, have the impact of fervor on the speed of the convert faith of county counselor task. So now converting a high fervor faith as a low fervor one should no longer be impossible, still hard of course. This is great because a lot of times when you're converting smaller religion lands, 
say you're taking over not Catholic lands, but maybe Mualati lands. They usually have really high fervor, and if you're a Catholic ruler, you may have really low fervor. Having this impact means that it's no longer going to take 30 years to convert some of these lands. You are going to be able to do it much quicker, which is great. It's, it's really wonderful. Having a strong hook on your realm priest now causes them to pay you max contribution. This is nice. Uh, I, I would have assumed that would have been in there before, but it's nice to know that it's in there now. Independence Wars. Ticking more score is now given to revolters if they fully control all of their domain, whereas Defender gets Ticking War score as long as they occupy at least one holding from the revolter's domain. I thought that this was, this is a good change because typically Defender, you would get Ticking War score as long as the revolters didn't siege any of your holdings. This kind of puts some of the pressure on the ruler who the other rulers are declaring independence from to make sure that you can actually go out there, beat their armies, and siege their holdings. It shouldn't be a problem for player characters, especially if you make sure to get a lot of siege weapon man-at-arms, but should make it easier for the AI independence claims to actually gain independence. Because sometimes, you know, they're sitting far apart. It's, you know, back and forth, back and forth. But now it will actually force those... Uh, large empires like the Byzantine Empire, Abbasid Empire, to go and siege down those revolting vassals declaring independence. All right, going down, AI should now found more holy orders. This was back in patch 1.1. I didn't see any changes, but when I loaded it up to test out some of these changes, I did see that some of my vassals were creating some holy orders. So thank goodness, if you're a Catholic ruler, you won't be the, uh, you know, having created your holy order and now waiting forever basically to be able to use it hopefully some of your king level vassals will now make some holy orders and you can use them in your wars vassals will no longer convert their capital when you demand their conversion this is a huge change but what i want to know is when a heresy outbreak occurs and a vassal you know converts to the heresy does this mean that when they convert and no longer converts their capital holding if that's so, this is fine. Uh, the The only problem was when there would be a heresy outbreak and all of your lands all of a sudden started converting to Cathar or a different religion. The only way to quickly reverse that would be to demand their conversions and then once they converted back to the faith that those counties would also convert back. So... If so, if heresies no longer automatically change those the land's religion to that heretic religion, this is fine. But if it does, this seems like a huge, huge nerf, a huge pain in the ass, especially if you're going for any of those achievements that require you to convert a certain amount of land, uh, especially the mother of us all achievement. Buildings now give percent modifiers to men at arm stats rather than flat mods. This should prevent stat inflation and keep cultural man at arms variants competitive. Yeah, this is this is a pretty big change. It used to be you got some flat stats, which would definitely pump up your man at arms a lot, especially if you got to empire status, had a huge domain. You can, you know, each of those holdings, you can build multiple buildings. It's it's really strong. You can have really strong man at arms. I just went in and looked, and those percent modifiers. Yeah, you can get a pretty big bonus, but it's not as much as it used to be if you just got a flat plus one. So, pretty big change. Uh, we'll see how it plays out. I'm sure it's still better to be a large empire and have lots of buildings. When feudalizing, there's now a random chance for a city and or temple to spawn in each tribal county. Higher development increases this chance. This is a pretty big buff to tribal rulers who want to adopt feudalism. Adopting feudalism gives you a pretty huge hit to the amount of levies and golds that you're making. And the fact that you have to build in each of those empty areas a city or a temple, that's a huge hit to how much gold you've saved up. So this is a pretty big benefit, and I think it'll make tribal rulers who want to adopt feudalism, it'll make it a lot, a lot nicer and a lot less painful. You can now arrange marriages for all of your descendants, not only your direct children. 
This again is huge, kind of plays into that matrilineal marriage AI change in that you can now make sure that your granddaughters get married off to good grandsons in matrilineal marriages if you don't trust the AI change. So this is a nice, a nice change. Although you don't have to do it, the AI will do it if you uh, don't want to get s super into the micromanaging. Increased county opinion bonus for putting down peasant or popular rebellions by 150%. Also increase the duration by 150%. This is great because yeah, <laughs> there's so many uprisings that you'll have, especially if you are, you know, trying to go for that Reconquista achievement, putting down the Mualati rebellions. You're going to have it constantly occurring, but the ability to more quickly convert those counties, as well as this increased bonus and increased duration of that bonus, should keep you from having to put down peasant rebellions almost, it felt like, every five years. So reduce the amount of levies and taxes gained from tribal obligations. Vassals now provide 75% and 40% taxes on the highest level of fame. This is a pretty big nerf to tribal rulers, but again, should make the transition to feudalism a little bit more tempting. All right, let's look at the AI section. AI will now abandon sieges that are blocked by a bigger garrison. <laughs> this is a much needed change. Uh, there's been a lot of times I've just seen AI sitting there. I mean, they may even have a thousand man army, but if the garrison's 1200, they're not gonna be able to siege it. And there could be land right next door that has a lower garrison that they could siege. So this, this should at least make the AI a little bit more competitive. Uh, inform the AI that it may not be a good idea to count allied vassals or lieges when deciding to declare war or not. Man, in my, my last run, there was so many times that Greek dukes would declare war on me just because they were allied with the Byzantine Empire. They can't call the emperor into the war, so he was sitting there with his 5,000 men against my 15,000 man army. Yeah, if the emperor came in, it would be a fair fight, but you couldn't call him in, so I just... How to smack them down, you know, get that quick piece because, I mean, there's no benefit of being a defender, really. So interface, toggling nudity is now a setting rather than a game rule. This is nice for people like me who, you know, want to make videos, but also would like the ability to have the nudity in game. That way you can turn it off when you're recording a video and don't have to worry about, you know, getting whatever YouTube does if you post some nude pixels in your videos. We work the dynasty window to include information about house and dynasty heads are chosen and you also see the military strength in the house list of a dynasty. This is nice in showing you perhaps maybe if you're in the Carling dynasty how close you are to becoming the dynasty head. It's always good to be the dynasty head. It's always good to be the king. Coat of arms is now decorated to make them stand out. It's just a nice little change, nice little beauty change. When raising a rally point that result in an army above supply limit, army will now be split into multiple armies and spread out into adjacent provinces. This should make dealing with supply of recently raised armies easier. This, uh, I can see it being nice, especially for newer players. However, I've gotten so used to the old way of everything being spawned in one province that it's kind of frustrating when it splits all out, especially since your man-at-arms are also split out. I usually like to have one strong army of man-at-arms, especially if I'm conquering some one province minor. I'm just going to rush in there, siege them down, and win that war real quickly. I don't want my man-at-arms split up in different areas. So I'm hoping that this will be something that you can toggle on and off because when I was testing it out, it was a little bit frustrating. Uh, let's go on down. Art, yes, there's some now new art, new audio, new localization, but let's get into the gameplay. A schemer is no longer safe from discovery until the scheme executes. If a scheme is discovered, there's now an ongoing chance that the schemer will be exposed and the scheme ended. This... I think is a good change in that at least you have an option of finding out if someone's planning to murder you. You can see who it is and maybe try and imprison them right away. Also, if you're planning on scheming against someone else, 
this is really going to incentivize you to bribe people, make sure that they join your scheme so that the secrecy is very high while you're scheming. When using demand conversion on Vassal Rule, they may now request a favor instead of only accepting cold hard cash. Uh, this I think is a nice balance. This does allow you to demand conversion if you're low on cash, although your vassals will get favors, you know, they'll get hooks on you, which, yeah, you know, can always be annoying, especially if they're feudal vassals, they're going to use it to change their contracts. Uh, let's keep going down, something about databases, let's look at some bug fixes. So added a recently converted trigger so that less flip-flopping happens in heresy events. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but if that means that when a heresy event goes off that you can't immediately demand conversion, that's going to be kind of frustrating, especially if this recently converted trigger is a long time. I really like when the heresies go off that you know it shows you vassal accepted heresy, ruler accepted heresy, and you can just click on their portrait and immediately ask for them to reconvert back to your faith. Yeah, this, this could be kind of frustrating to play with because then you're going to have to go into the character finder, look for these vassals who did convert, and then ask them to convert back. Discovering a non-believer secret now gives a strong hook on clergy. I always thought this should have been a strong hook. Glad to know that it's been changed back. Duchy buildings and similar that give fort level now only give it to holdings that have fort to begin with. No more having to siege down temples and such. This is a nice change. I always was wondering why I was sieging temples, but now it's good to know that I won't have to do it just because of a certain duchy building. Keep on scrolling. Friendly Council now has a cap of how many stat bonuses the perk can give. So this is from befriending people. There's been a couple other perks that have been changed to have a cap. So just something to keep in mind that uh, you can't just really abuse these perks to really pump up your, your ruler. This is a huge one though. Golden obligations no longer increase ransom prices. <laughs> I was abusing the hell out of this in my Mother of Us All achievement run. And pretty much any achievement run where you're going to get big and you siege down a lot of holdings, get a lot of prisoners, golden obligations was increasing like a 10 gold ransom to somewhere around 200 gold. It was huge. It was nice. You got tons of gold for, you know, some low level prisoners. But yeah, this is this is a huge nerf to golden obligations. It makes sense. And I'm glad that I looked at this before making a video about how to use golden obligations to get a bunch of money. But damn, it does hurt because I was loving just getting that one stewardship perk and then basically not having to worry about money from then. It's now criminal to refuse conversion, even if religions aren't the same. Great. I, I thought it was criminal to refuse conversion, but in some of my games, I asked people to convert and they, then I wouldn't get a criminal imprisonment on them. So this is nice, nice to have that be fixed. People will no longer be less keen marrying into your family if you have useless alliances. This is nice because there's usually such a big negative modifier whenever you're trying to marry off your sons and daughters to get strong alliances. And sometimes you have these alliances to your vassals that doesn't really help you in wars. You can't call them into your wars. So hopefully you'll be able to get more strong allies, which is really useful in the early game. The amount one gets from demanding payment is capped to 50 gold, or based on how much ransom worth they have if less than 50 gold. Again, this is about golden obligations, a second nerf to golden obligations. You used to be able to ask for somewhere around 250 gold if you're an emperor. And what I would do is get the, the perk where you know when you're going to die within one year. And then right before you die, you just go through that list, demand all the obligations. And I was making like 5,000 gold as an emperor. It was super nice. Well, it's been nerfed. I mean, I'm sure it's still useful. You probably get around maybe 1,500, but not, I mean, not as big as it used to be. Golden obligations, 
Uh, you helped me so much in my Mother of Us All achievement run, but unfortunately for everyone else playing on 1.2 and above, no longer. No longer. Natural lineal checkbox will now default to correct state based on character being married off when playing in equal faith. This is just a nice thing because sometimes you're marrying people you're going through quickly. You're not looking to make sure that your daughter is getting a matrilineal marriage. I've done it myself, and I've had to break betrothals, which, you know, is a pretty big negative modifier just because you weren't paying attention. So, glad that that's been changed. You can no longer declare war when you're behind bars, when you're in prison. This is... I mean, it makes sense, but it's also kind of a nerf. I did kind of like that you could be in prison, but be like, hey, I'm, I'm still just going to declare wars, whatever. You can now name children born in your court that of, are of your dynasty. This is cool, especially, I suppose, if you're a streamer. You can name all the children after your subscribers. But it may be a little bit of annoying micro, especially if you have, you know... Tons of sons and daughters in your court that are having more children. Those grandsons and granddaughters are having more children. If you got the octogenarians legacy, you're living, you know, 100 years. You're just naming child after child. Could be slightly annoying to keep on getting those pop-ups. But you can always just click the button that says, like, yeah, just give me whatever name you want. It uh, doesn't matter. All right, and that's the end of this TLDR Again, please do let me know if I missed anything. This patch is half the size of the 1.1 patch, so thankfully it was a little bit quicker to get through. But yeah, do let me know if I missed out on some huge changes. Uh, some things that I think still need to be added in is that we need to be able to save searches. I really like to be able to search for rulers that are not of the current faith as well as other searches, so but I would love to be able to save that one so I don't have to reset the defaults and then kind of go back each time. And another thing is that Dread is still OP. Dread is still an amazing thing. If you have a horrible leader, just execute some people who aren't of your faith, get that Dread up, and then you don't have to worry about those independence wars. All right, happy crusading. I hope that you enjoy creating your new rulers and... Yeah, playing a much more balanced game. Also, if you're a new player to Crusader Kings 3 and you picked it up because it's on sale on Steam, please feel free to look at my other tutorial content. Even though there's new patches out, a lot of the basic mechanics are still the same. Until next time, as always, do remember to take care of yourself.